What were the top five moments of the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series season? NASCAR's 75th anniversary season had a ton of big moments in it. 15 different winners over the course of 36 races. Some drivers got suspended. Some drivers got hurt. Denny Hamlin once again did not win a championship. We had some surprise winners. College Racing went out there and won a race with AJ Allmendinger. Front Row Motorsport picked up his win, win as well. We had an international driver come over and win a race in his first career start. You had JTG Doherty Racing with Ricky Stenhouse Jr. winning the opening race of the season, the Daytona 500, a monumental win for that team. So I decided to go through and try to break down what were the top five moments of 2023. So these are the break hard top five moments. I'm sure you're going to have your own. So drop them in the comments because I'm sure there's going to be some that you don't agree with on my list and maybe some that I missed and was like, oh, that maybe that is a little bit more important. So coming in at number five for me is the NASCAR Garage 56 program. And you're probably thinking that didn't even happen during the Cup Series season. And well, it did just not during the 36 race schedule for the Cup Series, but this program was massive. Right, The big boy Camaro went over the France. It stormed down the Malson Strait. It flexed its muscle, its big pushrod V8 power in the faces of Aston Martin and Ferrari. And sure, it wasn't in a class, but that doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it went out there and it brought NASCAR fans together. The program might not know what a kilometer is, but they sure as heck brought fans together in a way that we've never seen a program or anything in NASCAR do before, which was awesome to see. They brought Ford fans and Chevy fans together. It brought Toyota in and everybody was just jumping around like a big happy family, like it was the World Cup and we once again cared about soccer for the first time in four years. It was very cool to see. And if a British gearbox didn't fail on it, it likely would have gone all 24 hours and placed pretty decently in the final classification. We know it didn't have a class. We know it had more horsepower than the GT cars. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, a NASCAR Cup Series car, sure, with a few different enhancements, some weight reduction, and more downforce put on it, went over to the biggest 24-hour race in the world and showed that it could contend. And it also has people, once again, wishing it was going to show back up in 2024. It made the race fun, right? For a race that basically dominated by the Ferraris and went out there with their BOP adjusted to help them win in the return, but we're not going to talk about that because it doesn't make for a good story unless, you know, whatever. For Chevy and NASCAR to go over and do that in the 75th anniversary season of NASCAR was huge. It was monumental, and that's why it's number five on the list. Coming in at number four is the return of North Wilkesboro. The once abandoned racetrack sent to the retirement home to live out its remaining days was revived, thanks in part to a global pandemic and a literal truckload of government funds to help, you know, uh, infrastructure projects around the state of North Carolina, the track was able to be brought back. And for the first time since 1996, it hosts the NASCAR Cup Series in an official race. Not just a test like when Kevin Harvick did it and not some lower level series, but the NASCAR Cup Series went back to North Wilkesboro and they ran the all-star race there in 2023. It was a throwback race, right? Small crowd, absolutely packed out. Not a place to stand, not a place to sit in that entire racetrack. And Kyle Larson laid an absolute old school beatdown on the field as well. And while the race might not have been great, the vibes were immaculate all evening. And that's really what mattered the most. And it's going to be on a schedule again in 2024, having just undergone a complete repave, which will make things interesting for next season as well. But to see this racetrack get brought back, Certainly sparked fans' interest in bringing back other racetracks, and most notably is Rockingham. So we'll see if that can get done at some point in the future. But to see a racetrack like this that was on the verge of just complete deterioration, just falling down, there's no reason this racetrack should have been brought back. It was too far gone. But thanks to Dale Jr. and Marcus Smith and, like I said, a global pandemic, this track was able to be revived. And it has once again come back and it's thriving. And that's great news for everybody involved. And it's great news for Wilkes County and everybody in that area as well. So hopefully the racing's a tad bit better in 2024, but it was still a massive moment in the 2023 season. Coming in at number three is Ryan Blaney's championship run. And I know some people are going to say, like, that's not really that big of a moment. But it kind of is, because back in May, he was being called the next Casey Kane. A guy that was in great equipment but continued to underperform and couldn't win those big races and was never going to be a serious championship contender. He was called that by a guy that has less race wins and less championships now than Ryan Blaney does. Both me and Kyle Petty. <laughs> and hand up. Got it wrong. Ryan Blaney absolutely showed up when it mattered. And some fans are going to call his championship Mickey Mouse. It was gimmicky, right? He wasn't that good all season. And you're not wrong. He wasn't that good all season. He got the Coke 600 win, and then he was just kind of around. He went uh, countless, countless weeks without getting into the top 10. 
And then he still manages to win the championship. Over the final six races, he went two races. And then he had the great three-race run there to end the season, a second, first, and second. And he's standing on the championship stage holding the trophy because that's what matters. He performed when it mattered. And everyone's like, oh, he wasn't good in June. Doesn't matter if you're good in June. If you've already got a win and you've locked yourself in, you only have to be good through those final 10 weeks. And out of that, you don't even actually have to be that good until maybe if you make it to the round of eight. And that's what Blaney did. Made it to the round of eight, gets himself a win at Martinsville, locks himself in to Phoenix, finishes second, best of the best of the championship four, walks away with the trophy. And that's just how the game's played now. I don't think it's a great way to determine a champion, but it's the way they're determining a champion now, and Ryan Blaney is your champion. And he did it with a really impressive run there at the end. So to say he wasn't the most deserving over the final six weeks is wrong, because he definitely was. Was he the most deser deserving over a 36-race championship? No. But again, don't hate the player, hate the game. He just played by the rules that were laid out in front of him. Coming in at number two is Michael McDowell winning on the Indianapolis road course. And I know some people are like, why is that number two? Why is Michael McDowell even in the top five? And honestly, you could argue this could be one of the biggest moments of 2023. Michael McDowell went out and led 54 out of 82 laps in a front row motorsport car. And sure, the Gen 7 car has certainly increased parity in the Cup Series. But McDowell went out there and he outdrove the appointed road course king that is Chase Elliott. He beat him straight up. And for a team like Front Row Motorsports, a small team, to go out there and beat a team like Hendrick Motorsports, a Goliath in NASCAR, on speed, on a road course, not on a super speedway, is a monumental achievement. It's something that I don't think has gotten talked about enough. McDowell winning just straight up on speed is a huge accomplishment, not only for him, but also for that entire organization over at Front Row. And it's not their first win in the Cup Series, of course. They've won Talladega with David Reagan. They've won Pocono with Chris Buescher. Sure, it was a fog delay, and they won the Daytona 500 with Michael McDowell as well. But I would argue that winning on the Indianapolis road course on speed, beating Chase Elliott and Hendrick Motorsports straight up is a bigger accomplishment than all three of those combined. And for them to go out there and do it is absolutely huge. And McDowell finally got to have that big victory, right? He got to have his family there. He got to go kiss the bricks. And for him to have his two NASCAR Cup Series wins come at the two biggest venues in the United States, both Daytona and Indianapolis, is a great accomplishment. It's like Jamie McMurray when he won the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400 in the same year in 2010. Things like that don't typically happen, and for a guy that doesn't have a lot of race wins, it's big. And finally, we can shut up about everybody being like, Michael McDowell's great on road courses. Watch out for him and him never winning. He finally went out there and won. So now I guess we actually have to be like, hey, Michael McDowell's good on road courses, so we have to pay attention to him now. That win, of course, did lock him into the playoffs, and Chase Elliott really could have used that win. Even though he did spot the rest of the field seven races in the beginning of the season, he just narrowly missed out on the playoffs. So for McDowell, huge, and for that entire team, monumental. And coming in at number one is Shane Van Gisbergen's win on the Chicago Street Race. His first NASCAR Cup Series win and his first NASCAR Cup Series start at the inaugural street race in NASCAR. For the 75th anniversary, might as well have a bunch of firsts happening uh, on one of the biggest weekends for the sport. Sure, the race was kind of overshadowed by flooding and a literal biblical rainstorm that just hung out over Chicago for the weekend. But for SVG, he took advantage of the varying conditions, absolutely used his entire higher skill set to learn how to not only drive these cars but also be competitive in them and went out there and won the race. Sure, he's driven on street courses before, so he's already comfortable with the walls being that close. And with varying track conditions, both drying and damp and somewhat wet, he's done that before as well down in the Australian Supercar Series. Not his fault the rest of the Cup Series driver thought they could just waltz into this weekend and beat a guy that, you know, had never driven a Cup car before. And honestly, like, do we expect SVG to win? Probably not. Top 10 would have been like, yeah, totally expected that to happen. But for him to come in and win in his debut like that, absolutely skyrocketing him to the front of every NASCAR fan's mind being like, why isn't this guy over here full time? Guess what? He will be in 2024 in the Xfinity series. It was huge. Not only for the sport, but for him as well. It was big for an international audience. And it showed that like you don't have to be from America to come win in NASCAR. Like it's not just one specialized car for for the guys that you know live here and that was kind of the point of the gen 7 car right was to make it a little bit more universal make it more gt3 try to entice other drivers from other disciplines to come over and svg winning certainly helped out with that right at indianapolis later in the season we had six international drivers in the field the most 
ever, tied for the most ever in NASCAR Cup Series history. So SVG winning was not only just big for NASCAR domestically, but big for NASCAR internationally as well. And I know Cup Series drivers hate the fact that he came over and beat them. And honestly, they should. SVG came over and exploited them. He showed that there's more that they can do with these cars. And that's kind of what he did. He went out there and showed all these guys what can be done with the Gen 7 car. And guys like Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott and others were like, yeah, he he beat us. He kicked our butts. We got to get better. And Michael McDowell, back to my number two on the list, said he took it personally. And that's why he went and got in the sim and wanted to get better on road courses. And probably the reason he went out there in Indianapolis and absolutely laid it on him the way that he did. So SUG coming over and winning was great for him, great for track house, and great for the sport. It was also great to make these drivers wake up and realize we can still be better. And that's not a bad thing at all. Let me know in the comments what your top five are. Some honorable mentions, of course, are maybe AJ Allmendinger winning at the Roval, the second Cup Series win for Colleg, coming at a time where AJ was definitely struggling. Um, just, I think, having fun. So to come out and win a Cup Series race, that was awesome to see. You love to see the emotion from him and that entire team as well. Chase Elliott breaking his leg and Chase Elliott getting suspended probably could be on this list as a big moment. Um, Chris Buescher's five-race run in the summer there to close out the regular season where he won three out of five races kind of came out of nowhere. They looked really strong heading into the playoffs and then kind of came back down to earth. So there's a lot of big moments that happened in 2023, and hopefully there's more big moments that happened in 2024. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.